Welcome to Sermon and Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The texts for October 11th, 2020, the 19th Sunday after Pentecost, are Isaiah 25, 1 through 9, or the semi continuous Old Testament lesson is Exodus 32, 1 through 14, Psalm 23. Philippians 4, 1 through 9, and Matthew 22, 1 through 14, which is really my favorite thing Jesus ever said about evangelism until he then kept going at the end. But I love, I love, I love this to thinking about uh, an, an evangelism or a kingdom text uh, that says, all right, the people that were invited weren't worthy, so go out and... Uh, Go to the alleys and the, you know, the back rooms of the bar. Go everywhere and invite everyone. And then everyone from the streets was gathered in, and it included both the good and the bad, so that the wedding hall was filled with guests. I like that, that it's both the good and the bad, and probably the ugly. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it, uh, clearly when we look at the other texts too, uh, with the Isaiah text and then the Psalm 23, you have this, the, you know, the theme of the banquet and the theme of the, of the feast that God hosts. I, I think one thing that we like to imagine about this parable is that uh, it's, it's a good thing to be invited and, or you want to be on the invite list. I, uh, except for the fact that one of the things that we've talked about and been talking about with Matthew, and you go back and look at, you know, look at Matthew's themes and particularly last week's, uh, last week's commentary with regard to what is our responsibility? What are, what are our responsibilities once we're, once we realize that we're part of tending that kingdom? Uh, it, it, you know, the invitation could go both ways, uh, it, you know, to use, uh, it, it could, it, it could be good news for some people and not so much good news for other people if you really don't want that responsibility. <laughs> yeah, if, if, I, like, thanks, but no thanks. I, I, uh, thanks for the invite, but, um, yeah, I, I'm not really to take, really to take that on. And so I, I, I think I would play with that tension a little bit. Uh, that we want us that we want to say, oh yeah, you know, I want to be on the invite list. But at the end of the day, uh, do you really realize to what you are being invited? And of course, it's a, it you know paired with the other texts, it's the invitation to uh, to the presence of the kingdom of heaven, uh, the feast, the table that God sets, uh, which is a table for all people. And uh, but it, but it's going to come. It's it's going to come with an ask, and uh, and I think that that's I. You know how how to how to help people think about. Would you say re yes right away, or would you say, well, uh, let me check my calendar, or uh, I, I think I might have. I think I'm busy that day. Uh, I think I might have another appointment uh, because, wow, you know, this is what you're signing on for. And here we are again with Jesus doing another one of those. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like, and it is an extension of an invitation to those that we might not say belong there. I love what you're doing, Caroline, to talk about how we respond, whether or not we want to respond quickly um, because the invitation has been extended. Um, but as I was reading this, I, I was just thinking about all of those folks that we would get frustrated with in terms of having received the invitation in the first place. And, and in the context of, uh, of the Isaiah text, I didn't do this last week, I'm going to go ahead and do it here, uh, is just uh, extending it to that this is what the kingdom looks like. It is an invitation to the folks that we want to put on the outside, the poor, those who uh, are outsiders. And uh, if we're going to be frustrated with who's going to be invited by God, then this whole, um, this whole um, uh, program needs uh, the kind of uh, uh, reconsideration that you just lifted up, Caroline. Well, and when you get an invitation, uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes you do want to look at the guest list, right? <laughs> and say, well, who else is going to be there? And who do I have to sit next to? Is there a seating chart? Uh, and I, I mean, I think you really could, I think you could, uh, real, I think you could really unpack that, you know, just the ways in which this touches, uh, 
you know, one of the, with the angle that I was talking about, but then also the angle you were talking about, Joy, in terms of, uh, in terms of our human condition and our human propensities to have a kind of control over that uh, or to be able to make a, a dis, you know, to be able to make those kinds of decisions and, um, and is this the best, you know, is this, is this what I really want to attend or not? So I, yeah, I mean, you, you do often want to like, okay, yeah, who's going to be there? No, well, that's okay. I don't think I want to go. <laughs> if y'all, y'all, if all y'all were at the party, I would go, but like all the three of you, but, uh, but I don't know about other people. Well, what would you wear is the big question according to this parable. So that's, well, that is always the um, question, Matt, is yeah, what is, to wear. What is the attire uh, is, is a very, very critical question when it comes to accepting an invitation. So, because and, there are shoes. Consequences. and the shoes. There are consequences. There's also yep. consequences to not showing up for the first invitation. So this, this is such a hard parable and there's, you know, so many inclinations to want to fix it, you know, and you'll see this in the commentary, but there's you know, various ways have been proposed to try to relocate where God might be or where Jesus might be in this parable. And it's this, poor guy who gets tossed out of the party, some kind of, you know, negative character, some rogue, or is it really Jesus? I mean, there's been, there's histories of sermons trying to make this parable square with, for God to love the world or something like that. Uh, and it's tough. I, to me, it's, I think we have to have some empathy for the gospel of Matthew here and have to try to figure out, um, what has traumatized this gospel in general? Again, you've got, this is not the only parable that's worried about outsiders who are faking their way in or sneaking their way in or people who uh, don't really belong or people who have disrespected the host in some way, shape or form. Uh, the violence of the parable is obvious, but there's a, a trauma there that is partly located in the temple's destruction and in Jesus' death, but also in the ongoing identity of whoever the Christian communities are that this gospel you know, arose from and circulated in. And it's really hard for me to pass judgment on that, not knowing what that looked like, what kind of um, violence that community might have suffered or inflicted. But, um, but I think we need to just, again, go back to the question of where is the like offense here? Like what's, what is it that Jesus is upset about throughout his ministry? And it's the things that get him upset are the forces that deal in death. Whether we want to talk about those in terms of, of demonic uh, uh, images or creatures, or we want to talk about that in terms of certain kinds of, of legal ramifications of, of illness or of impairment, but also in terms of religious leadership that says we're going to, we set the rules and we don't see religion as necessarily liberative, but as more constraining. And um, in a gospel where he's trying to set people free, we have to ask, well, what's then, what's the opponent? And, and so, you know, before we jump into trying to figure out who exactly this man is or who the first people who disrespected or who declined the invitation and why they declined, you know, I mean, we've got to kind of enter into the the offense and the pain that this gospel is trying to speak into and the wronged people that this gospel is trying to speak for all the way back to chapter five, right? In the Sermon on the Mount. I don't know if I have answers there, but I think I'm I'm asking preachers to sit with empathy with this whole gospel for a while and its very strong emotions and one of the words that you've those used into the pulpit on Sunday when you preach on this, Matt. One of the words that you've used uh, to to talk about reading this gospel this year is contend with. Uh, you said you've uh, come to appreciate contending with this gospel. Um, feels to me like this is a contend with kind of week. Oh, totally. It better be, or something's probably wrong with the the, the preacher. <laughs> if you love this parable too much. Um, I, I worry about you maybe, but yeah, I think so. You know, I, I, I have enjoyed, I have grown from working with Matthew in the last four years 
partly because the last four years have been a time where more than any other time I have wanted to write certain people out of the Christian family and redraw the lines of what counts as Christian and what does not count. And that sometimes is done out of anger and dismay. And so here's a gospel that I think sometimes does that in dangerous and wrong ways, but also is a gospel that, that reminds me to, again, em with empathy to see myself on the side of the oppressor and not necessarily on the side of the liberator and to be drawn back to this notion of um, there better be a God who's willing to give multiple invitations out there or I'm in big trouble. Uh, you know what I mean? I, I can't be part of a Christianity that, that writes out certain people and says that's an illegitimate expression of Christian faith. Um, even though I really want to do that. <laughs> like I really, really want to do that. But I feel that doing that is not owning up to the, the interpretive history or the, the actionable history of what Christianity has been as a force of both great good in the world, but also of great oppression. And so I need to own up to the fact that there are ways of being Christian that I find morally, to say problematic, but I, that has to drive me back toward getting my own house in order as opposed to saying, you're out, bind them up, put them into outer darkness, <laughs> you know, don't invite them, they're in, which is, to be honest, my propensity these days. I want to take a... <clears throat> sorry, that was like confession. I'm so sorry I did that. I'll just... Let's talk about the psalm or something, or joy, rescue me, or absolve me, or something. I don't know if I'm going to rescue you. You just gave me permission uh, to say something that uh, is a way that I've always looked at this text but I'm going to practice what you were just trying to admit or confess that you do. Trying. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, um, the high expectation that is called for, you know, we, we kind of teasingly talked about, you know, the problem is the wardrobe. You, you were invited. And the expectation is if you're coming to this, this is what is expected of you. And the fact that that wasn't lived up to meant, okay you're out. Um, there are times when the groups that are invited that have received this invitation don't meet our standards. And our belief is they don't meet our standards because they cannot meet God's expectation. And for me, this text says God knows they can meet those expectations. And when they take for granted, oh, hey, I'm in then they're gonna be held accountable. So this is not for me a reading that says that the, uh, the poor, the uh, oppressed, the, the outsider can't have the same ethics, the same values, the same um, uh, uh, intellect, the same morals that those we expect. This says they absolutely can and God knows it and they are to be held accountable in the same way that everybody else. Now rescue me somebody, please. Thank you. Well, I think we could run to Isaiah 25 and make us all feel better, but that's maybe it's too early for that. I don't know. Come in. She <laughs> said, I'll give you shelter from the storm. I was I always wondered if Dylan uh, didn't, uh, wasn't inspired by the uh, Isaiah 25, shelter from the storm, but be that as it may. Uh, oh, Steve I hope reads, so. He was inspired by Isaiah 5, you know, with All Along the Watchtower. So, Actually, All Along the Watchtower was from a different part of Isaiah, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> wrote a paper on that once in college. That's a great college where you can write a paper on Bob Dylan. All right, so um, I like Steve Reed's commentary on, on the website a lot, and I would point people there. The, the, the red thread, uh, Caroline, there's a feast in the gospel lesson, so guess what? Can have a feast in the Old Testament in the Psalm. The, uh, um, the one of the things I've learned uh, in the last uh, seven eight years um, is that money was not invented till after the exile, and this is an exilic text. Um, and so, before money, um, the primary metaphor for God's abundance and the abundance of God's provision and the abundance of God love. God's love, the primary metaphor is the feast. And so um, this is a story that's looking ahead. 
This is an eschatological text looking forward to the end of death itself. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make a feast. And what will he do? He will destroy the shroud that is cast over all people. He will swallow up death. And what does that look like? It's a feast to which all the nations are invited. I think this text is really building on a text that happens in Isaiah 2, and I think it's either Micah 4 or 5, uh, that all the people will come to the, to the mountain of the Lord to learn how to pound their um, swords into plowshares. And this is then continues that. It's, uh, it's the, the vision of the peaceable kingdom to come, a feast uh, to which we are all invited. For those people who are doing stewardship at this time of year, especially in a year that's been really difficult uh, economically in a lot of congregations and a lot of your members are losing businesses and have lost employment, that this future vision of hope uh, and the abundance uh, is one to hold out there for people. If we pick up Psalm 23, I mean, there's one way, you know, you, as I said earlier, and as you were talking about, uh, Rolf, this image of the, of the feast and, and overflowing cup, of course, is that, is that thread throughout the text. But, uh, but if you take Psalm 23 on its own, one of the things that I, I've been thinking about a lot lately and talking with preachers about is the way in which texts that we, you know, that we've known and that we've heard, of course, drastically change in meaning in different circumstances. And particularly when there's a circumstance that's communal or global or national, or uh, you think about um, the, how, how Psalm 46, for example, sounds after 9-11. I mean, and so we, there's, I, the way in which we, we spend some time intentionally pondering reflecting on sort of the before and after interpretations of texts given an event like uh, like 9-11 and in our case in, in COVID and the pandemic. And, uh, and the last time we heard this text was, uh, was of course, Easter 4. And, and I, I think it would be curious to, to as sort of a homiletical or interpretational um, journey or experiment to talk to, to, to preach on this passage saying, okay, here it was in Easter. How does it sound today? Uh, how does it, inviting people into the ways in which, how does this, how does Psalm 23 sound on October 11? Uh, and, and compare that to how did it sound the fourth Sunday of Easter? And, and, and really exploring that, that, that reality of that we make meaning, how do we make meaning or how do we, how do, we do meaning from text? And, and one of the ways is that around the text, that liturgical context or the contextual context that deeply shapes. And to what extent this, this text has also uh, been heard numerous times for people with regard to uh, losing loved ones uh, in a funeral is one of the you know top funeral texts. So that would be one. I it, you could do the connection, do the thread. But if I were one option, would be to do something like that with Psalm twenty three and really exploring, um, really having pe inviting people into that interpretational moment uh, for themselves and say what's changed in their own lives between. Good Shepherd Sunday and October 11, that they hear something different in this passage. You have stunned us into silence, Caroline. Uh, I doubt that very much. Um, okay, so any more on that, but we can go to the golden calf. What a great story. Not all feasts are approved of by God. <laughs> mm. I to put this image in the imagination of everybody just to ruin it for you. Um, I had uh, a group of college students uh, that did a project where they gave a visual for this in the first slide that they put up before they put up uh, uh, the, the typical Id Id idolatry. Uh, they, they put up a calf, a leg calf, that was gold, <laughs> a yellow gold, a yellow leg calf. And so now whenever I read this text, the first image I have, it's of a gold 
leg. Anyway, not all feasts are acceptable. Ralph, you were going to say something good on this. Well, I don't know about that. Uh, but th this is also a feast, a hog. Uh, uh, it's declared to the Lord. Uh, I, point, I would point people again to uh, Vanessa Lovelace. Uh, com her commentary on the website. Um, I love this story. This may be my favorite uh, story in the Pentateuch, um, just because it's got so much, uh, it embodies so much of the beauty of uh, Old Testament narrative and how it works. It's got this rep this phrase that repeats five times, um, uh, who brought us up out of the land of Egypt and different times. It, it, it refers to different uh, different folks. I think there's two false images uh, that the people of God are tempted to worship throughout time here. One is the human leader. I mean, uh, the crisis is that Moses is hanging out with God on top of the mountain, talking about the law for so long that the people grow afraid and they've lost their human leader. And they say, so therefore, come make Elohim for us who shall go before us for this man, Moses, who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. We do not know what has become of him. Uh, I translated Elohim uh, because it can be either singular or plural. And the NRSV translates and NIV translate it plural, come make gods, plural for us. Uh, the Jewish, uh, the NJPS, the Tanakh, the Jewish translation translates it a God for us. Um, because after all, they only make one golden calf and then they declare it a festival to Yahweh. Uh, so then that's the second image to which the people of God are tempted uh, to worship, which is the, the cult itself, the building, the, um, the, uh, the, the color of the carpet or the way the sanctuary looks or, or the music in your tradition, all that stuff. Um, we, we tend to either worship our human religious leader or, or the religion itself rather than the living God. And then of course it ends up, uh, like I said, you get an orgy here. Uh, the, the phrase in verse six, they sat down to eat, drink and rose up to revel. That word revel uh, suggests um, as, uh, you know, an orgy and uh, not the kind of feast or worship that God wants. And then God and Moses get into an argument about, about whose people they are. And uh, in the end, um, Moses holds God accountable to God's promise. God, you promised. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, how you swore, you promised. And then God remembers uh, God's promise and forgives the people and sticks with them. It's, uh, it's just a great text. Rolf, I have a, I have a um, Hebrew question for you. So I love that. You love that? I love that. I get a Hebrew Me too. question. All right, so uh, I, so the, you know, the term Elohim, that's actually one word I do remember from Hebrew, and, uh, and yes, so it can be plural or singular, correct? So yep. is there something there, though? Is there something with that ambiguity that also highlights what the people want, uh, you know, that, that, here we have the one God, right? The, the, the one Yahweh. Um, that is, of course, the unique claim of, of Judaism, of the Israelites, of believing in one God and not many. Um, is, there, is there something there that's also just kind of, uh, yeah, highlighting the, uh, the idolatry uh, from, you know, the one God that, you know, that on whom they're supposed to count, but then but then now gods, is there anything to that or am I? You mean versus a, a polytheistic uh, yeah. pantheon or something? Yeah, like uh, these are your gods and that's not the point, you know, that, well, it, it's not the point on many levels, but yeah, these are not, you know, you have one God, not many gods. Is there anything to that? I don't, I don't think so, but I'd have to think more about it. I mean, okay. it, it's the, the evidence in the text it's, it is mixed okay. um, about whether we should translate it God's plural yeah. or God singular. Yeah. And it's in the end, it's a morass. And that's why you get two major uh, <clears throat> traditions about how to translate it. But the- I do think it's kind of curious though. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 
I grew up with the Ten Commandments movie, the, you know, um, which was to think about this as they're making an image of a false God. But actually, I think this is a story of making a false image of the true God, because they, after all, they make the calf and they say, this brought you out of Egypt. Tomorrow is a festival to Yahweh, it says clearly. So it seems to me that this is actually about our, our human tendency to recast the one living God in our own, own image, mm -hmm. because we want something tangible. I mean, following a spiritual, invisible a God by faith is really hard to do, especially when you're wandering in the wilderness. I mean, that, that's scary. And um, it's scary for us at this time to do it, you know, coming in this pandemic, in this crazy year we've had, you know, it's, it's really hard. I think to me, that's finally what the parable is about. And then it's about God's fidelity to God's promises. And my cat makes an appearance on Sermon Brand. I love it. He was also in the background. He was, he's been very, yeah, he's very cute. Yeah, I just think, I, I don't know. I just think it's curious, like how, you know, you, you do have that, you do have that ambiguity, but the way in which, you know, like you said, Rolf, the way in which we uh, explore our human tendency or the human condition to uh, look for other um, gods, if you will, uh, and how difficult it is, how challenging it is. And here we have a text that says, uh, no, the, the one in whom you trust is the one God, Yahweh. And then what, what happens when God doesn't, you know, do what you want God to do? <laughs> and so our, our desire to, to move on or to find something else. So I, I think that's a really important element of this passage uh, to, ex to explore and look at our own, uh, our, our own propensity toward that same, obviously toward that same um, desire. The appeal that you point to uh, of God's fidelity uh, is uh, a powerful uh, argument or exchange that's going on between Moses and God. Uh, where Moses is saying, this is who you are. God, this is who you are. And therefore, this is how you treat your people. Um, what does it mean for us to want God to destroy the folks that are doing what we think they shouldn't be doing, using God's own words against them? Versus being, and in this, in this role, M Moses is, is almost a priest because he's speaking on behalf of the people saying, you know, these are your people and you promised. Um, I, I think that is a different take on this moment uh, in terms of, of, of how we are about those people that uh, we could say, oh, look, I got a text to use against you. God will agree with me against you on this. And maybe that's the moment where I should have empathy for them and be the answer to their prayers to say, I will show you the God that loves you because he does. Yeah, Vanessa uh, draws, I mean, one angled take on this is this is how to pray, uh, to get in there and contend with God and uh, argue with God, hold God accountable to God's promises and God's character. Walter Brueggemann has a famous essay on this in uh, from an Old Testament theological perspective that ties moments of prayer. I think it's in his book, The Psalms and the Life of Faith. I can't remember the title of the essay, but of course, uh, those of you that know Brugman says it's a daring act of prayer, right? It's always daring with Walter. And uh, I think that that is also maybe uh, just a different angle on this is just to focus on the threefold prayer of Moses and how Moses argues with God and God changes God's mind. But let's move to Philippians because I want to know about Eudea and Syntyche. I'm sure I pronounced their names terribly wrong. Eudea, Eudea. What do you want to know about them? Um, How to pronounce them? Are they of the same <laughs> mind in the Lord? They they weren't when Paul was writing this, as far as Paul could tell. But these are important figures. We know nothing about them except this mention right here, but it's, um, it's notable that we've got Paul instructing two women 
Um, and he doesn't say, tell them to be quiet. Nope. Tell them to mind their own business. Tell them to get in line. He just tells them to be reconciled. So there's a, I, this is often lifted up as a, as a tacit endorsement of these two prominent women's leadership in the Philippian congregation where Paul makes no effort, shows no embarrassment at their, um, what's the word I want, their visibility, their influence. Um, but something's wrong and so he urges somebody who goes unnamed to help reconcile the two so that they um, um, might not, I guess, um, so that their division might not be a distraction for the Philippines. But the assumption is, of course, that they are, have been co-workers with Paul uh, in the gospel, um, you know, the, the workers with literally soon ergo and uh, is the Greek. And, and, you, and then you have this loyal companion. We don't know who that is. Uh, this yoke mate, right, that, um, that Paul is uh, speaking about. But what I find really striking in this uh, is, is this, this recognition that all of this, all of what Paul has been able to do uh, and, the, and the capacity for the gospel to to extend to where it has extended has been with coworkers, with with yoke mates, with help, with communities, with people, with relationships, and it's uh, it's just a lovely glimpse into what the you know what it what does it mean to do the work of the gospel? What does it mean to spread the good news of the gospel? It's this radically uh, co-working existence that uh, that we that we that. And it necessitates that of who are your yoke mates, who are the ones who are coming alongside you uh, to make this happen. This is not an individual affair. So I, I just, I love that, you know, just that, like this little um, glimpse into what, what, the, what the church looks like and what the church is about. And we're not alone in that. Indeed. This verse, um, outside of preparing for uh, the podcast, uh, this verse has been with me um, most all of uh, the last couple of months uh, um, as we d look toward the end. Uh, finally, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of, of praise think about these things and, and i just took the time to just read it because that that verse has been just attacking me when i pick up my twitter feed or read through facebook or turn on npr or listen to the news on television where these are not the things that I am being encouraged to think about. And I don't know, it coming up in the reading might be a challenge to um, our listeners uh, to invite their congregations to what it is we think on as this peculiar people of God. 